Good morning and welcome to the ninth meeting in 2022 of the Equalities, Human Rights and Civil Justice Committee. Um, our first agenda item today is to decide whether to take items three in private, which is consideration of today's evidence. Is that agreed? Uh, now, we can, now we can see people. Yes, yeah, so that, that is agreed. So th thank you all very much. Our second agenda item is a session on the lives of gypsy travellers in Scotland, and I refer members to papers one and two. And I welcome to the meeting our witnesses, who are Suzanne Mundy, who is Gypsy Traveller Programme Manager at MECOP, Dr Lynn Tammy from iWrite, uh, Dr Maureen Finn from STEP, the Scottish Traveller Education Programme, Leslie Dury, who is National Coordinator at Article 12 in Scotland, and finally we have David Donaldson from Progress in Dialogue. Thank you all for attending to give evidence today. You are all very, very welcome. Um, can I please remind witnesses that if you wish to come in on any of the questions, just to indicate that by typing R in the chat box, and I will do my best to bring you in, and my clerks will, will keep an eye on that to make sure we are not missing anybody. Um, so, To start off, can I ask each of our witnesses to make a short opening statement, starting with Suzanne Monday, please? Okay. Um, good morning, everybody, and thank you for the opportunity to give evidence to the committee this morning. Um, so, we, as I say, we welcome the opportunity to give evidence to the committee on progress against the implementation of the Scottish National Action Plan, improving the lives of Scotland's gypsy travellers and the five key themes within it. Whilst the principal focus of this evidence session is not the pandemic, it has been our experience that progress against the action plan has been and continues to be inextricably linked with the impact of COVID-19. For the last two years, much of our efforts and those of our partners have been to support the community through the pandemic, and this has been on top of our day jobs, where we have done our best to maintain core services. This has meant that progress against the priorities in the action plan have either been delayed or stalled. There have been, however, notable achievements, such as a £20 million accommodation fund as part of the commitments within the Housing to 2040 strategy. Yet, this has also caused a sense of frustration at the slow rollout of the money and local authority decisions either not to apply or to delay applying. The decision to extend the current action plan is, I think, recognition of how much still needs to be done. However, the action plan as it currently stands cannot be a static document. It must take into account and reflect new and emerging priorities, such as the impact of rising fuel costs and the overall cost of living on a community which is already disadvantaged economically and financially. For example, an advice and resilience service we set up as part of our immediate response to support the community through the pandemic made over 90 successful applications for welfare benefits, hardship funds, charitable grants, referrals to food banks and emergency fuel top-ups. We are extremely concerned that the cost of living increase will continue to impact disproportionately on the community. So, in closing, our contribution today is very much from an organisational point of view, and we would urge the committee to undertake further engagement work directly with the community to hear their views firsthand. Thank you, convener. Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, now, Dr. Tammy, please. Thank you, convener. Um, for me, it's, I won't repeat because I think that what Suzanne has done is very finely put probably most of our thoughts over to committee already. Uh, but just to add that a major issue for me is the drawing down at local government level of funding that's available for either new build sites or upgrade of existing sites. Um, I feel that it's too slow, and also the issue about how this is dealt with by the people that are working at grassroots level. 
I just wonder how that is monitored and evaluated across Scotland. Are there comparisons had? Another issue that's continuing for us, and, and COVID is connected to this also, is the issue of digital inequalities. Although a lot of work has been done since uh, COVID first came to these shores to get data and devices out to gypsy traveller children and young people, my concern is the follow-on from that. There was provision of data that is not continuing. But also, how are young people supported to continue with their learning, and particularly learning that takes cognizance of the nomadic underpinnings of the community? So, should, I, I, want, I would like to see people turning things on its head and not saying that young people and families are are, are um, interrupting their learning because of their nomadic practices. I'd like to see how provision is made, particularly online provision, that young people can continue with their learning, but it still fits with their cultural practices. Thank you, convener. Thank you, uh, Lynn. And now, um, Dr Finn, please. Uh, morning, committee. Thank you again uh, for having me as well. Um, I am coming from STEP, which is the um, Centre for Traveller Education. Our work is really to ensure that nomadic communities like Gypsy Travellers have equitable access to education, but also that children's rights to education are respected. Uh, we work closely with the TNET, the Traveller Education Network, um, a body of local authority staff. And we've recently, as part of the action plan, um, uh, developed a network with 80 teachers um, to deliver di digital learning throughout Scotland, and that's local authority staff. Um, I echo what Suzanne has said in that um, a lot of our work um, on the action plan has not only been stalled, but it's shifted. We've had to be quite reactive and change our normal ways of working to make sure that we deliver some kind of services for um, families throughout the pandemic. Um, the list of barriers to education um, experienced by families, as Lynn has touched on, has been huge for many, many years. and It ranges from racism to practical things like transport. And family concerns about the fact that the schools and the perceived irrelevance of much of the curriculum to traveller lives. Um, it's a fact that in all education indicators, gypsy traveller children have for many, many years continually fared worse than any other group. And the stats only show half the picture because there are many children who don't ever go to school. Um, so recently, we, we carried out research with 16 local authority staff and 10 families, which revealed the devastating impact of the, the pandemic. And this mirrors what Lynn and um, Suzanne, I think, have just said. Over two thirds have said that there's been a significant, significant decrease in engagement in education, and worryingly, that many of the families are young families with primary school children who have not returned to primary school. Now, the implications of this for the future are, are, are really worrying. And while we distributed over 100 kits as part of the national initiative during the pandemic, digital kits, um, staff reported only a slight increase in the use of technology for education. Again, this echoes what Lynn is saying. The emphasis here is on the digital divide and that families at home, traveller families, are not in many cases able to support their children with technology. Technology was used for many other useful things, but not for education in the main. Uh, most worrying, I think, is our recent consultation with 10 new families. Few knew about the availability of help and resources in education, and they talked about the lack of continuity across <coughs> from one local authority to another. And this has been an ongoing concern of mine. We need to have consistency. Uh, the problem, I think, is forecast to grow because local authority staff are also reporting that they're increasingly stretched. Following the pandemic, um, there are many, many families out with the local, uh, the gypsy traveller families who need additional support for learning services. So, you know, it, it, it's a bit of a lottery now. And on a positive note, just to finish off with, both parents and teachers uh, reported that they saw immense potential in positive benefits in the use of um, digital technology for the future, and the fact that it did complement the traveller way of life. If they were supported enough um, to use it effectively for education. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. And we now go to Leslie Drury, please. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me this morning. So I'm from Article 12 in Scotland. I work with young gypsy travellers. 
providing educational support, capacity building, and pathways to work. So one of my key concerns this morning is to help share some of the views that we've learned from our young people in regards to their concerns and the issues that they're having. Uh, in particular, I'd like to agree with all of the witnesses prior to this, that what they're saying is absolutely what we're hearing from our young people. In particular, there are concerns about continuity of services between local authorities, whether that's educational services, mental health services. Um, we'd really like to see a stronger plan for supporting families, no matter their housing situation, whether they're living roadside and shifting between local authorities or they're in a settled site. Additionally, we want to see a lot more focus on, uh, as Dr. Tammy mentioned, sort of digital uh, issues and digital access for young people, because I think this is a way forward for many young people to have continuity of service. So thank you for having me this morning. Thank you, Leslie. And uh, finally, if you can go to Dady Donaldson, please. Am I on? Thanks, Joe. Um, yeah, I first gave evidence this session about five years ago now, um, and I think I described the situation towards gypsy travellers in Scotland as having stagnated for decades. Now, whilst I'm sitting here today, I'm very thankful that there has been some progress made, particularly in starting a conversation around inequalities that gypsy traveller communities face in Scotland. We have also seen some movement in terms of accommodation. I think that's been already articulated before me by the other witnesses. However, there is still a real need to recognise that inequalities and issues continue to persist towards our communities today in Scotland. And I hope to raise some of that today. Some of the key points are the unsustainable funding models that we continue to see rolled out from central government level towards projects which are very important, they do fantastic work, but they aren't given enough funding to be sustainable and continue year after year. So we saw that, for example, with the great project. Um, I was then with Article 12 that I was involved with the Gypsy Traveller Youth Assembly, where we brought together some fantastic young people, really empowered them to tell their voices and tell their stories, but the funding didn't continue. And I'm really sad to see that, that model is continuing throughout many of the third sector work. We've also seen a rise in gesture politics, and I don't raise this to put a dampener on the great co-production that's happened and the <clears throat> cross-party work, between, particularly between COSLA and the government as well. But we have seen a rise in people making statements that are seen as more gesture than action, particularly at central government level, that don't translate down to the grassroots. And so there's been many occasions where activists such as myself have went along to events and heard some fantastic rhetoric, but that hasn't then translated into action. And the gypsy traveller communities living at the grassroots haven't seen any fruition from that rhetoric either. The other point I was hoping to raise was that we saw some fantastic coordination of services such as toilets, water and sanitation during the COVID lockdown. However, this is no longer the case and families roadside are continuing to struggle to access basic needs. We are also not seeing any adequate provisions or protections put in place for ancestral stopping sites, a point that I raised 2017 as a point of significance me and my own family. We see that particularly in despite of cross-party support for a motion to protect ancestral stopping places in 2018. The other point that I want to touch on, and I'm just going to touch on it because it has been raised by one of the other witnesses as well, that's the cost of living crisis and our movement towards a cashless society. I'm growing increasingly concerned, particularly for employability within gypsy traveller communities that tends to follow trades and tends to follow uh, an oral teaching. You know, Very little gypsy travellers um, go on to do apprenticeships and these types of things, which we know is an inequality and an issue. But we need to also think, well, if we're moving towards a cashless society, particularly after the pandemic, how is that going to impact communities that traditionally work on cash and particularly don't have a permanent address? And lastly, a point I want to raise and a point that's been raised by many activists for decades now is the fact that we still have no government apology for the cultural trauma and what has been termed as the cultural genocide of gypsy travellers throughout the 20th century, forced removal and forced centralisation of families throughout Scotland. Now, this has been, uh, apology has been called for by activists such as Rosanna McPhee and Seamus McPhee, and certainly others as well. 
And I just hope that in 2022, in this year of Scotland's stories, that this will be the year that government will strongly consider making an apology, strongly consider recognising the impact of cultural trauma on today's inequalities, and tell Scotland's gypsy travellers' story in full. Glad to be here. Thank, thank you, Davy. Um, before we go to questions, a number of you mentioned the grassroots, and I just want to put on record that the committee, as part of our ongoing work program, absolutely determined to go out and, and engage directly with, with the community uh, when, when that's appropriate. So that, that's certainly something that's in our in our, our plans for, for the future. Um, we're, we're now moving to the um, uh, to questions, and um, so I'm going to hand over to Maggie Chapman first. Thanks very much, Joe, and good morning to our witnesses. Thank you very much for, for giving up your time to, to join us this morning, and thank you for your opening remarks. There's a, there's a lot of challenge in, in what you've already told us, um, and, and a lot of areas for us to, to, to work on, both as a committee, but, but I think, as, as Davy said in, in his final comments, as, as a government and, and as a country more, more generally. Um, I, I'm interested. Many of you have talked about the, the, the work that local authorities um, do, the services that they provide, and obviously working either indivi with individual local authorities with COSLA. The action plan makes mention of the need for close partnership working, and obviously there are different levels of responsibility between local government and the, uh, and the Scottish government. But the third sector agencies and organisations play a, a crucial role in, in, in all of this as well. And, and I was just wondering, uh, may, maybe um, if, 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 I, if I can ask each of you in turn, what, what are the things that we are getting right with the partnership working? And maybe more, more, um, more importantly, what are the things that we are getting wrong? And what, what is it that, that we need to fix? A couple of you have already talked about things like the monitoring and evaluation happening Need, needing to be comparable across the country and that kind of thing, but but I, th I think I, I'm interested in specific examples if, if you have any and if if you're prepared to talk about them. So I'll I'll go to Suzanne first. Okay. Um, thank you very much, um, Maggie. I think in terms of what could be done better, um, I think it would be really really helpful if each local authority and or health board were required to develop a strategic plan setting out how, as a local authority, they are going to meet the requirements of the, the National Action Plan. Because at the moment, the, you know, the development of such groups across Scotland is incredibly patchy and inconsistent where they are in existence and there is um, community involvement, I, I think that that does help with the partnership working. It does help build relationships. But as I say, these groups are really quite few and far between. So I think that's something that would be really, really helpful. But I also think it's important to provide support to the community to participate. And that can be practical support, such as um, access to digital devices, support to use devices and um, to the best of their um, capacity. Um, I, I think also that you know the five organisations that are here are essentially the main ones um, that are working with the, the community. There are. Um, a number of other community groups um, who are doing fantastic work. Um, I would say that in Perth and Kinross, there are certainly two that spring to mind. Um, but again, it is about adequate resourcing for those groups as well, because it's all very well, I think, saying we want to engage and you know we want to work with the community. But if the community don't have the resources and the capacity to do that, then you. It, it, it is essentially empty words. So, so that would be my view. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Suzanne. That, that, that's really helpful. Um, can I ask Lynn for your comments on this too, please? Um, first off, the partnership. That is right. We all need to be working in partnership, but there needs to be a line of equality there or equity. And sometimes that isn't there. And sometimes there's directives coming from which I'll describe the Parliament as central government here just for the purposes of 
So there's, you know, we have direct d directives, very good directives at times coming from central government down to local government and down to the third sector. But as I mentioned before, you know, wonderful offers are wonderful and money is really important and good amounts of money is important. But it's how that is drawn down and how it is dispersed at the local level. And there is not a consistency there. And indeed, and there's a number of local authorities that are they're, they're not participating or not considering participating on what is an offer when we're talking about equality for the community. Um, and certainly, I think that there's a gap between what the thinking is within the third sector and the thinking of, of policy and plans coming out of central government and what the thinking and understanding of that is at the local level. And by the local level, I mean the, the street level workers, the people who, who would be delivering on this, whether that's your planning officers, your housing officers, community development workers, social workers, and, and so on and so on. So, although there is a good attempt and work to, to create a strong partnership, there is there's too much fragmentation, in, in, in my opinion, um, and also agreement on, on, on what considers the humanity and the dignity of, of, of people. I want to give an example here of um, looking at upgrading of sites, thinking about decanting people if, if a site is going to be getting upgrades. Now, down in England, the, the, the general consensus there is, is the local authority in question would have a piece of land that everyone would be decanted to so they would still be together and there would be room there for trailers and, and, and so on. Now, from my experience and understanding and people from the community coming to me, um, that is not happening. And the stress that that is putting on families is, uh, well, it's immeasurable, the stress and the trauma that will come after that. Families who rely on each other for support and uh, mental health support as well are not able to get that because their close family members are could be in other schemes or in other streets. So as we're thinking the tightness of the gypsy traveller community, if there was an understanding of that at the local level, then there would never be a decision taken to house people all over the city or a town or whatever. So for me it's really about if we're talking about working in partnership we have to be sure that all actors in that are fully aware of the culture and the needs of the Gypsy Traveller community in that respect. Thanks, Lynn. That, that's, that's really, really helpful. Um, Maureen, Lynn, Lynn has just spoken there about that, that kind of top-down directives and, and the, the mismatch, the disconnect. You, you spoke, in, Maureen, you spoke in your opening remarks about the for example, the curriculum not necessarily being relevant to uh, a traveller community's lives and, and, and their experience. I wonder, Maureen, could you could you pick up on on that and and and, and give us either other examples or, or or a little bit more on how how we've not got that right yet? Yeah, I, I think it, it echoes some of the previous comments. It, it's a disconnect, I think, between national and regional delivery and. Um, I, I'm a great advocate for the changes that have um, occurred in Scottish education over the past. In fact, I've been involved in a lot of them over the past five years. And uh, to be honest, it's unrecognisable now. You know, there, if, if you read the top level policy, then there are no reasons why Gypsy Traveller children shouldn't have a personalised learning experience that is relevant to their culture and that equips them for whatever lives they lead and that they should have choices whether they want to lead a traveller life or whether they have other opportunities open to them as well. So the disconnect I think happens um, within leadership at local authority level um, because there's a as I as I mentioned, you know, it, it, there, there's no continuity between services. So for example, one of the local authorities I know, probably with the most um, gypsy travellers in Scotland, 
has no specific education um, staff dedicated to delivering either outreach or inreach or any kind of services, which also would suggest that it's not in the strategic planning, which would suggest that the curriculum um, has not been designed to be relevant. Whereas other authorities, you know, might be smaller, have less gypsy travellers, um, have very, very well organised services which meet the needs in a very strategic way, encouraging children into primary school, picking up children where they drop out, thinking about pathways, all that kind of thing. And I mean, a, a good example um, of the, the non-interpretation of policy uh, would be um, in terms of attendance, uh, whereby you know, like. The seamless coding has become increasingly flexible over the past years. Gypsy travellers perceive um, the, the coding and uh, the tracking of their whereabouts and their children's attendance to be one of the main barriers for them actually turning up to schools. And, and they don't need to. The communication is not coming out from the local authority. In fact, even nationally as well, to be honest, on this on this level, and if they were aware of the fact that um, you know codes are designed to be flexible to accommodate different lifestyles, then they wouldn't opt out. They would they would they would work with local authorities in dialogue to try to find more flexible solutions. So that's just one of the examples of where the policy and practice could be much much better, but it's not being. Um, you know, it, it's not being used in the way that it was intended. Uh, just finally, in terms of the irrelevance of the curriculum, you know, the, the curriculum um, documents now and, and the, the transformation of the curriculum accommodate for um, you know, like gypsy traveller based material. It's not just about what children learn; it's how they learn. It's problem based approaches. It's real life scenarios and situations. It's intergenerational kind of approaches. It's using technology. It's all of these things form part of the curriculum. It's relationships. Um, all that's written into the curriculum, and it could absolutely meet the needs of gypsy travellers, but it's not, unfortunately. Okay, thanks, Maureen. That that that's quite a quite a significant challenge for for education across the board, isn't it? To to to, to enable us to to get that right. Um, Leslie, you spoke. About education as well, and 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 some of the the, the issues around continuity of, of services. I wonder, could you could you say just a little bit more about where 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 we where we could do better around partnership working, around that building that continuity, and actually embedding it in how how, how <coughs> the, the the services the, the the functions that we we design how they, how they play out and how they actually support the young people that you you work with. Yeah, absolutely. Great question. Um, so I'd like to reemphasize what Dr. Fenn has said that, that that question of continuity and the difference between local authorities is a major part for us. I will say on the positive side, everyone we contact in local authorities is very eager to partner with us. They're very supportive of kind of the goals that we can create together. Um, however, between local authorities, we've had the experience recently, we've started a roadside education pilot, um, which means that in the northeastern highlands of Scotland, we're looking to find families who are living roadside and helping them with educational support. So we needed the help of local authorities to, um, to give us the references if they knew of a, a family living roadside, if a family came into their local area. And what we discovered once we were making these connections um, in such a detailed way, which we had never done before, was that the difference in how uh, the structural design of who was responsible for handling gypsy traveler families living roadside was wildly different between local authorities. Um, and oftentimes it seemed that they essentially assigned it to whoever whoever had the capacity. Uh, so in some in some local authorities, it would be a gypsy traveler liaison officer, which is great, or there might be a teacher of additional support needs that's assigned to uh, a remit for young gypsy travelers. However, often we were finding that the person in charge was, for instance, someone in housing simply because it was being seen as an issue of housing. Um, but if you can imagine, that's a lack of training and a lack of capacity for all the other support and signposting that a traveling family might need um, to simply say, well, it's an issue of housing. They live roadside, let's assign it to housing. Uh, we also have seen some, for instance, where a, um, it's, it's considered simply a, a issue of what site they're headed to or what site they're living on. Um, so seeing that, what's being treated as sort of a uh, semantic um, when in fact there's such a wide breadth of support and signposting that these families deserve, we aren't seeing much continuity between local authorities that way. 
That, thanks, Leslie. That, that, that's, that's helpful. Davy, if I can come to you now. You, your challenge was to move away from gesture politics is one that I, I hear and I've heard you, I've, I've heard you and others speak about this before. Um, I, I suppose one, one, one of the, the obvious questions is um, what is it that we need to do differently? Is it in our engagement, in our direct engagement with gypsy travel communities? Is it, I mean, you spoke about funding and the sustainability and continuity of funding being, being really key, but, but there, there seems to be, there's obviously a, a gap, a, a, a disconnect, a, a, a hole um, happening intentionally or, or otherwise. And, and I just wondered what, what your thoughts on, were on, on some, some of the ways through that for us. I mean, I think when it comes to partnership working, you know, on one level, I, I want to congratulate the plan in recognising that, you know, local politics and national politics when it comes to gypsy traveller inequalities can be totally disparate. And I think the plan, you know, recognises the need for partnership working principally between, you know, uh, the Scottish Government and COSLA. And I think that's something to be celebrated. However, my role as an activist and the role of progress and dialogue in supporting grassroots community champions to defeat their own marginalization in a way and, and you know and be empowered to to take the lead and take the charge in their own right to me partnership work needs to be much more localized it needs to be much more grassroots i think there's some great strengths in supporting the third sector to act as a go-between. I think there's some great strength in funding the third sector to, you know, create projects to empower and um, sustain engagement as well with grassroots communities, something which I benefited from as a young activist as well. But I think to me what we need to start seeing is how both MSPs and local government as well actually work with their own gypsy traveller constituents, be they constituents living on a permanent site or be they constituents moving through their area on a, a regular basis. You know, how are we seeing that engagement happen? How is it how is it characterized and is it sustainable? My experience has been that it isn't sustainable. It very rarely happens. And if it does happen, it's because we've got a particularly passionate um often politician or perhaps a housing officer or a GTLO who's pushing for that to happen. So I want us to think about, well, how can we create that into a system? How can we make sure that local gypsy travellers are supported to, to be empowered on issues that matter to them? You know, I think to me that there is the partnership which is lacking. That's the partnership that's been disconnected. I think we focused on supporting the third sector. We focused on the third sector being a go-between between, between communities and authority. And I think we've overlooked the fact there's actually some fantastic grassroots communities out there who, you know, move into these areas or maybe permanent in those areas who have their own um, issues, who have their own things that matter to them geographically. And I think, well, how do we access those communities and how do we talk to those communities without a go-between? You know, to me as an activist. The whole reason I do this is to try and make sure that equity is built so that gypsy traveller communities are treated no differently to settled communities in terms of, well, the issues that matter to gypsy travellers matter to politicians and their decision makers as much as it does settled communities. And I think what we often do is politicians, particularly at a local level and a national level to a certain extent, and this is a challenge, but they rely or they, they become scared. I'm going to use the word fear, actually, because I've had quite a lot of conversations with local councillors, particularly, who have expressed, you know, I just don't know how to do this. You know, I wouldn't feel comfortable going down onto a gypsy traveller site alone. Had that told to me, you know, there's a real fear. And I think because of that, we then fund the third sector to act as a go-between instead of thinking, well, our duty as authority is to make sure that we're engaging with these grassroots communities directly. So, yeah, it's a bit of a mixed bag for me when it comes to partnership. I think what's been done thus far should be celebrated. I think there is a role for the third sector, but I also think the third sector are being made to fill in for the gaps and the the lack of action from authority as well. That, thanks, David. That, that, that's really clear. Um, Joe, I'll be guided by you. I, I know Suzanne wants to come back in briefly, but I'm, I'm conscious that I've, I've maybe hogged. hogged <laughs> so far. 
Um, I, th I think if, if we could move on, that would that'd be good. More. Suzanne, if you've got something in particular to say, I'm sure you'll find a point to bring it back in. If we could Thanks, move Jay. to Karen, Karen Adam, please. Thank you, convener. And I want to thank um, our, our witnesses this morning for not just being really insightful, but, but also educational. And um, something you, you spoke about there, Davy, in particular, is that engagement um, with our gypsy traveller community within our constituencies. And I'm certainly going to take that away. So thank you for that. Um, what I would like to ask is, well, I've, I've heard a bit this morning about where perhaps in the plan that things have stalled. Um, you know, reasons for that, um, of course, was, was highlighted being the pandemic. But even the pandemic aside, you know, just in regards to the plan being parts of the plan being stalled overall or held up, um, I'm just wondering if each of you could probably give me a little insight into where you feel that that has happened or or where you know it has happened. Um, let's start with Suzanne, please. Um, okay. Thank, thanks, Karen. I think, I mean, it's really just echoing what, um, you know, witnesses um, have, have previously said, that I think the biggest frustration and certainly something that has been fed back to us is the, the progress on more and better accommodation, which is possibly the overriding priority within the, the action plan. And um, so, for example, um, you know, again, where there has been progress in terms of things like the, the interim site design guide and, you know, community members have been involved in that and the first iteration of that has been published. I think it is the ability to, to drive forward change. And we've been working with community members, um, both in terms of the, um, housing, um, the, the accommodation fund as part of housing to 2040. And, you know, we understand that there, um, some of the delays have been around, for example, things that are beyond the control, both of local authorities and of Scottish Government and Parliament, such as Brexit, um, you know, the impact of COVID on, um, you know, um, the sort of essentially society shutting down for you know probably over two years now but you know we we know from the community that there is a lack of um site accommodation there are issues with the the, the planning system um davies already talked about roadside camps and traditional stopping places and I think these are probably the things that have um, been delayed the, the most and which have ha you know, just really fueled that sense of frustration within the community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, could I go to Dr. Finn, please? Yes, uh, um, I, I suppose there's two things. I mean, the first thing is the fact that access to um, working with the community has installed during the, the pandemic and, and that went on for a long time so one of our initiatives was um, um, trying to increase uptake of the 1140 hours for early years um, in childcare education and you know, the community just did not want to be concerned uh, with that at that particular time it had, there was so much going on and, and, and we got involved in a lot of other things as well um, what actually happened was we spent much, much more time being strategic and planning and working with a, a, a cohort of local authorities. And uh, one of the strong messages came out of that was the fact that delivery uh, couldn't be coherent across authorities, that actually there had to be local and regional differences, um, not just because of the geographical spread of the families, but also like the nature of the families' lives, how they travelled, whether they went to school, whether they lived in houses, whether they lived in sites. And it's a whole different kind of ball game. So we've managed to kind of really um, kind of modify approaches, and we've now got a national guide for teachers, for staff, for everybody, and we're we're, we're now delivering that successfully. Um, you know, we've, we've delivered 100, and we're now on to our second round of 100, uh, and we're working with about six local authorities to do that. So that's been a kind of a, a benefit. Mm. What really stalled for us really was um, community advocacy. Um, I mean, I. I don't take issue with what Davy said, but um, you know, I think that as a third sector, I don't know whether we are third sector. Um, to be honest, we, we we have a strange position because we're not knowledge exchange at the university, but we work 
on a consultancy basis, on a research basis, very, very directly with families, and then we could be seen as third sector in the way that we deliver uh, kind of national messages. Um, but we, you know, we, what we try to do is we try to get as broad a national picture as possible by consulting with communities, and then we try to make sense of that. But community advocates are absolutely central to that process. And I think you know, we're still struggling to redevelop relationships with particularly young people, young mums, become community advocates within local area to, to train them to lead childcare workshops and things like that, to increase their own literacy skills so that they have the confidence to then you know, go out and set up groups and be advocates for their own educational processes. I, 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 and the big challenge of that is the fact that you need so many community advocates because you know there's no one voice that represents any aspect of that community. So we need young mums who have lots of children, who live in sites, who you know, blah blah travel a lot, all that kind of thing. And we're finding that a real challenge just now, just because we need to get a national picture. Um, you know, people are just like not as, as as keen to be involved in that kind of advocacy way because there's so much going on. But that might just be our experience. I don't know. No, that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, could I ask Dr. Tammy, please? I suppose coming on the back of um, what Maureen's just said, I really was taken by her point about needing many advocates and that mm. whole self advocacy, if you like. But it goes, but everything is linked here. All the issues that we're speaking about accommodation, employability, education, they're all linked. And for people to have that voice and to truly participate, so not consultation or a few voices, you know, being seen to, to represent the whole, if you like. To have that, we have to go back to first principle, and that is about capacity building. So if we're looking about encouraging, I don't know, young people as an example, then empowerment is not something that you can hand to somebody in a jug. And go there you are, have it, and off you go. When people have not been had that leveling, and you know there's been higher and lower sections in society, people do need help, especially if you've not been engaged in the, the normal decision-making processes or democratic processes. There needs to be that support there, and that is a role I think, and it's a continuing role. Um, in the third sector, looking specifically, well, Leslie can speak for our organisation much better than me. But that's what's at the heart of that: it's working with young people so that they have that capacity built, that they can look at ways that they can access apprenticeships, whether that's through the provision of online learning, that they can get the core skills that they maybe didn't get in school. But there has to be a point where everyone is brought to the same level. And for me, that's about true empowerment through true participation and, and, and capacity building, if you like. So it's not a case of saying we need to, you know, we would do ourselves a disservice if we, if we speak about getting rid of one layer of support, because it's then almost like, I mean, I did community development course a lot of years ago. And my grounding was always about not being really careful that you're not setting people up to fail. It's a, you know, it's it's a it's an equal partnership when you're sharing learning with people. But you have to understand that people have to have that critical consciousness opened yeah. up, if you like, and that comes through capacity building. Thank you. Um, could I ask Leslie, please? Um, so, a major part of uh, what Suzanne has mentioned is this idea that a lot of the action that we've seen in the action plan has been around a common a lot of us pushing like education for capacity building. Uh, in particular, something that I think could use a much clearer way forward is tackling racism and discrimination. It's, key, it's a key part of the action plan. And what we're hearing from our young people is that this is very central for them. This is something that they want to get involved with. Uh, we've also heard this through MECOP um, from the community members that work with MECOP that uh, for our young people, it is very much something that they're ready to have um, a bigger voice there, to feel empowered there. Um, but I think that we need a clear way forward. We need to we need to know what this action actually will look like. And I do know that um, Scottish government has been working on that some. So I think there's going to be some things in the near future 
Um, but just to emphasize what Dr. Tammy is saying, the young people are there, they're ready. Um, we just need to help them kind of come to center stage. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Um, could I ask Davey, please? I think there's many points on the action plan which have stalled. Um, and there have been many different excuses tabled, including COVID. But I think we need to be realistic with ourselves as well. We're moving into a time with lessening this restrictions of a time of freer movement. You know, we're not seeing the same restrictions as we did in the first lockdown, for example. So I think we need to start being realistic in what we expect of the action plan and where we expect the action plan to actually come forward with action now as well. I'm not going to touch on some of the points that I was going to because they've been articulated already by the other witnesses. But one point I do want to touch on, and following on very much from, from what Liz has seen it said as well, is that of the movement for change, I think is the wording in the, the action plan. You know, this the need to tackle the racism and the discrimination which persists towards gypsies and travellers in Scotland. To me as an activist, working with many local authorities on issues like accommodation and some of these other quite at times complex and unwieldy issues, you know, to do with funding streams and all these other issues that, that come to that. When you boil it right down to its core, the issue doesn't lie with how the funding gets distributed or where the funding comes from or, or if there is funding in existence. The issue lies with human action and human thoughts around gypsy traveller communities. We see gypsy traveller communities funded less often. Their services are not given adequate attention. We've had some good examples already around engagement, particularly with some local authorities, not having a worker at all that looks to engage with gypsy travellers in a sustainable way. And the reason for all of that is racism. Boiling it right back down, the reason gypsy travellers are treated differently is because they're seen differently or not seen at all. So I think what we need to see happen is gypsy travellers given the empowerment that they need. I agree with Lynn, and I said in my opening statement or, or earlier on certainly that you know I owe a lot of my activism to that early start I got in terms of being you know developed as an activist. I think that is important, but we need to see a real shift in direction to to think well okay we're delivering on accommodation, but that happening in silo isn't going to change anything. We need to change society's views on gypsy travellers. And the only way that we can do that is by tackling unconscious bias, by tackling stereotypes, and by tackling the discrimination which surrounds us. And the way that we do that is by empowering gypsy travellers to be seen. Most of the time when gypsy traveller community champions are seen and heard, people leave thinking, well, that's not what I expected. You know, that's not the way I was told gypsy travellers are. That's not what I was brought up thinking. That's what we need to see happen, and that's what we need to hear in order for any of this action to be long-changing and long-standing. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank, thanks, Eric Carlin. Um, I now move to Alexander Stewart, please. Thank you, convener, and good morning, and thank you very much for your comments so far. I want to look a bit at the plan itself. Now, as we all know, there are five themes that have been brought out from the plan, and they are you know, accommodation, access to public services, better incomes, tackling uh, racism uh, and discrimination and the better a uh, representation. But Davy, you talked about earlier and, and you've continued on that about the rhetoric. Now, <coughs> it's good to have all of these themes, but not all of these themes are working at the same level across the sector that you have. Uh, and it would be good to talk about you know, what you think will develop in the long term, because at the moment, probably the biggest issue facing uh, any individual is the cost of living crisis, and that has a massive impact on all of these. Uh, and and it would be good to hear about the priorities. Do you think any one of these themes has a, a higher priority, uh, or uh, are they are they running in parallel with one another, or or is there one, as I say, that is overtaking at the moment in being seen as the theme that is making the most progress? So maybe from you, Davy, because you've got some very strong views on that already. I think they all intersect, right? I think it would be wrong for me to say, well, you know, accommodation is more important than, you know, employability or, or vice versa. But I do think we need to shift focus slightly in the sense that we've all been focusing on accommodation. There's a lot of partners around this table today 
there's a lot of partners out there that aren't represented in this meeting. And I think we need to make sure that we're thinking, how can the labour be um, you know, delivered by different partners? And how can we make sure that we're not missing out areas or themes to prioritise certain themes, which I would say has been happening up until now? I think employability and the cost of living is something that I am um, I became acutely aware of recently, um, particularly a lot of my engagement is with Gypsy Traveller men, and a lot of them are really worried about their businesses. They're really worried that very few of them have what we would term as professional training or professional qualification. Most of them have learned their skills um, orally or have been taught them by, by other Gypsy Travellers, principally their fathers and brothers and that kind of thing. Now, most Gypsy Traveller men haven't had that formal education that many settled people take for granted. And I think that whilst you know there are issues with formal education settings, something we need to start thinking about more is how we can help gypsy traveller young people access employability sectors that might not traditionally have been accessed by gypsy travellers, making sure that they don't feel they have to constrain their way of living into a certain occupation. That's something that needs to be looked at, but I think when it comes to the daily living costs and, and trying to reduce the cost of daily living, we have seen some great work happening locally, but it is not cohesive and it's certainly not across the board. So I think, well, how can we take those models which have been proven to work, proven to make a significant impact on families, and broaden them out to a national perspective? That's one thing. I think when it comes to living costs, we can't overlook movement towards a cashless society. For most people, this isn't an issue, but if you do not have a fixed address or do not have formal education, opening a bank account, for example, can be something almost impossible for, for some people without correct support. So how are we supporting people on a national level? Again, there's some local work happening, which is great to see, but how can we broaden that out so that it's not some gypsy travellers have this support and are able to access employability and a cashless society won't matter to them, but others are totally on the edge and financially speaking are facing you know, great difficulty if we do move towards a, a cashless society. Susan, you, you talked about in the opening, your opening statement about frustrations uh, that, that the sector may have. It would be good once again to get your view about how the themes are managed and is there frustrations across that process uh, and developing the long-term access. Sorry, is that to me? Yes, sorry, Susan, that's to you. Oh, sorry, yes, so, sorry. Oh. Um, I think that um, in terms of the frustration, one of the my, my colleagues mentioned at the very beginning that you know the, the the joint work that went on with partners, with Scottish government, with COSLA. Um, you know, when we were in the particularly acute phase of the the pan pandemic, showed what could be achieved where there was a will, and you know how you know potentially very bureaucratic um, and maybe admin heavy systems could be adapted and made flexible to enable better partnership working. So I think there there is a model there, and we need to look. Uh, at how we we can take that forward and you know not lose the learning from that approach because that was effective but i think the main frustration for me is you know the action plan by its very nature has a time limit so the key thing is what happens beyond the the current lifespan of of you know the the the, the current action plan um you know um, work, working on equality for the community is everybody's responsibility, and I think what we need to see is how it's going to be embedded across housing, across education, across health and social care, across the criminal justice system, across everything. Thank you, and, and Lynn, you, you spoke about the, the sort of grassroots issue and also that there was a big disparity amongst the councils uh, and, and how they manage things. So is that the case, that there is a, a, a difference across some council areas when you're looking at these five themes and how successful they've been? 
Uh, yes. Um, as, as others have said, and Leslie pointed that, that out really well when she was talking about their work reaching families who are living roadside, that in some local authority areas you have uh, gypsy traveller liaison workers or officers, GTLOs. In some, some areas it's a, a, a teacher, some it's some, someone in housing. And that, that in itself just demonstrates that there, there is no continuity of service because these are all very different. They're all professionals and indeed they're probably very good at their, in their profession. But there is such a difference on the way that, that, that these people operate and their knowledge around the community that I don't think you could ever have continuity of service across when there is such a difference in skills and knowledge base within the people, or indeed there are local authority areas that don't have anybody in particular. Um, I wonder if I could just, um, if I may, go back to just what, what other people have been saying there, and because it just always brings me back to the, the issue of capacity building. So when we're talking about members of the community having their voice, it does all go back to capacity building. If people are not being seen and heard, that's perhaps because they don't have the confidence to be seen and heard and feel that they're going to have the backing of local authorities, local local elected representative, or indeed yourself, people like yourself. So it's all about about building that as well. But capacity building also for those professionals that are working with the community. So perhaps there needs to be a network established. I know that Step have TNET, which is a network of teachers, which works really well. So perhaps we need to be looking at a network of all the individuals, whatever their profession, coming together and having their capacity built so that they feel confident. There's someone I'd mentioned earlier about people not feeling confident, not sure about the culture, you know, worried that that they'll get something wrong. So that's that whole thing. But going back to first principle, I think, is we need to look at what's there and that gypsies and travellers, plus the professionals that are working with them, feel confident to come together and work together. I hope that answered your question. I know it went off a wee bit. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and thank you, convener. I think you know time is pressing and uh, my questions have been answered. But if uh, other colleagues want to make interrupt. Uh, I'm more than happy to give them some time as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And can we now go to Pam Duncan Glancy? Um, thank you, convener, um, and thank you to the panel for your answers so far um, and for joining us today. It's been really helpful. Um, if, if possible, I want to um, talk a little bit about the cost of living and extend part of the conversation we've just just had. Um, and specifically, I'm keen to know, given um, the the lived experience of fuel poverty. Um, and the, the fuel poverty strategy that we have in Scotland. Um, do, do we think the needs of the communities you represent are sufficiently addressed in the fuel poverty strategy and also, um, in, of course, in the, the action plan? And do you think work, further work will need to be done given the upcoming um, energy cap rise and expected energy prices? Um, I'm also keen to hear um, a bit more about the impact of the cashless society. Um, that, that David's been mentioning. Um, so, thanks. Anyone in particular, Pam? Um, possibly, I'll start with David. Actually, just because um, um, I've been quite intrigued at that, that that concept and how we can, yeah, how we can address it and, and support people through this cost of living crisis. I think when it comes to fuel. Poverty strategy. I'll leave that part to Suzanne because I know there's been some work already happening on that. Um, however, I will pick up your point on the cashless society and just add to, to what I've said. I think when it comes to the cashless society, again, I just want to reiterate that for many people living in housing, particularly, um, but broadly speaking, the settled community, it won't impact, it might not be, or certainly it won't be as large an impact as it will be for the gypsy traveller community. Who have traditionally relied upon cash, principally because opening a bank account can be quite difficult, got literacy issues, or a lack of formal education. But also, if we boil it down to the basics, if you don't have a permanent address, it can be very, very difficult to 
to gain access to these types of services. Now, I think when it comes to the cashless society um, in general, I don't think central government have paid enough attention to it as perhaps they should for all communities. And at Progress and Dialogue, we do support a range of marginalised communities. Um, and many of those marginalised communities are really concerned about it moving towards a cashless society. However, when it comes to gypsy travellers, I think we need to think, well, how are we going to support people to improve their employability and also um, work to, to, to mitigate these impacts that are going to be coming with the cost of living and with moving towards cashless society? I think the two have to marry up. I don't think they can be taken in silo. I think if we're talking about employability and supporting gypsy travellers, you know, going forward perhaps into different career paths, we also need to think about how it's going to impact on the traditional career paths of gypsy traveller people. I won't take up too much time. I'll, I'll perhaps pass to Suzanne if that's all right to pick up on the, the fuel poverty strategy. Thanks. Thanks, Davey, and thanks, Pam, for the question. And I'd like to go back to a point that's coming across really strongly in just how interconnected everything is, because I don't think you can look at fuel poverty without looking at the quality of accommodation for the community. If that accommodation is not wind and water tight, then your fuel costs, your heating, etc., um, is going to go up. Um, we also know from our work with the community that a lot of the issue, um, you, people are already, already struggling with debt management in terms of energy costs. So that, you know, you're already starting from, from that sort of financial disadvantage. A lot of families rely on bottled gas and the cost of bottled gas is really expensive. Um, we have families who actually don't have access to an individual energy account. And it's quite technical, so um, forgive me if this sounds a bit confusing because I'm never quite sure about this, but our understanding is that on some local authority sites, the, the local authority is the principal account holder and individuals on the site buy energy essentially from the local authority. Um, so if that is the arrangement, then again, you're limited in being able to find the most cost-effective tariff for yourself. But that in itself links back to um, the digital divide because so many of these deals require you to go online and to be able to search. I know that I find that quite confusing myself, but you know, if you don't have a device, if you're not confident in using IT, if you have problems with connectivity, then again, those are additional barriers. So all of these things are interconnected. Thank you. Um, convener, could I ask a couple of supplementaries on this as well, please, if that's okay? Yeah, if you're sticking on the same area, then yeah, I mean, there's a couple of folks still to bring in. It is. Thank you. Um, specifically, actually, in just directly to respond to Suzanne's point um, around that, it's really interesting. Do you have any information from the people who you represent about the, the likely increases of um, any tariffs, um, particularly where local authority is the provider um, or the account holder? Um, and, and is there anything that, that can be done to, to mitigate the impact of that being passed on, but also um, recognising the, the cost that a local authority would have? Um, and then my other question is slightly broader, but still on cost of living, and it's about what could we do to make sure that Social Security Scotland can provide the best possible service to the gypsy traveller community? And the, the point that we've heard, um, actually most of the, the panel make um, around making sure that they do training and engagement with the community and understand the interconnected um, aspects of it. And again, I guess it goes back to the, the point of the, the casual society as well. Thanks. Thanks, Pam. Um, in terms of getting hard evidence, um, we, we, we don't have that in terms of this is what the additional cost is going to be. What we have heard directly from community members is, um, you know, just, and I think probably, you know, akin to the, the settled population, are just huge worries about 
the, the cost of fuel on household income. And we do know, um, you know that this is um, a community that is already financially disadvantaged. So I think there's potentially a piece of work to be done there. In terms of what local authorities can do, um, we have been made aware of a funding that is going out to local authorities to help offset or to mitigate to some extent you know, the, the um, increase in the cost of living. And I think it's called LACER funding, L-A-C-E-R. It would be interesting to know how much of that is any is being directed towards gypsy traveller communities to help them offset any increased costs they have. We are aware of work that has gone on um, in two local authorities. Um, Perth and Kinross is one that springs to mind, where they have worked with a local community group around vouchers which have been distributed to um, members of the Gypsy Traveller community to, to you know, help meet these costs of, of living increases. But in terms of a Scottish-wide picture, we don't have any further evidence at all. So I think there is a piece of work to, to be done there. Um, in terms of Social Security Scotland, um, again aware that Scottish Government are currently undertaking some research to look at um, the community's experience of Social Security Scotland and the welfare benefit system. That work is currently ongoing. And we are aware that Gypsy Traveller um, community members are part of that research. So we're awaiting to hear what those results are um, and then hoping to take any recommendations forward. Right, back to Pam. Is there anybody else you were particularly wanting to bring in, Pam? Um, thank you. No, um, unless um, David or anyone else had anything further to add. Uh, yeah, I think I think David does. Sorry, I've been calling you David. That might be your Sunday name, David. Thank you. That's all right. Um, yeah, just a, a really quick one um, and a model of good practice that I think should be should be noted and, and perhaps encouraged in other areas. Um, Progress and dialogue have been working very closely with Aberdeenshire Council, and um, we worked. Principally over the winter months of 2020, it seems so long ago now, but 2020 into 2021, um, to produce and enact a flexible wellbeing fund that supported marginalised communities to access funding, which had always been available um, from the local authority, but had been made available in a way that wasn't accessible um, or people weren't comfortable accessing. So we had a network of community champions from marginalised communities, um, some from gypsy traveller communities as well, and many of our applicants were gypsy travellers, um, who took calls, supported in the paperwork, supported in um, families being able to access funding that was given direct to the families and certainly supported through the winter. We're now moving to uh, another fund, which will be opening in the next couple of months, which will be looking at the cost of living crisis. And again, that's open to all marginalised communities. But we did see, I think off the top of my head, about 70 or 65, 70 percent of applicants were from gypsy traveller families. Um, so, yeah, I think that's something that, again, could be a model that could be used in other places. You know, working with people and organisations, communities who have strong relationships with marginalised communities to access pre existing funding that's there to support with the cost of living. Hi. Thanks. Dr. Lynn, did, were you trying to come in on this one? Uh, please, it's just to come on the back of what Suzanne was saying and you know, talking about this whole issue about the local authority being the, 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 the buyer, if you like, of, of fuel, of power, and then selling that on to all intents and purposes to, to, to residents on sites. I think it's really important to state that this is not a new issue. Way back, I'm sure it was about 2011, we were engaged on a site trying to negotiate because the local authority was setting the unit price on the meters in the units, and the, the, the residents had no option or choice to, to look to another provider, if you like. So, local authority was deciding who the, the company was that they were buying from. 
and then selling it on, if you like, through their meters, which I, I always find a bit odd anyway. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that that's a local authority's role to be a third, you know, an intermediary, you know, buying fuel in and, and, and selling it on. And th there's been several issues around that, and that's ongoing, and obviously before 2011, that people were having to, they just couldn't afford it. They were having to just, you know, no have. So they had utility units that they couldn't heat, so they were showering and cooking and freezing cold units. So this is not new. This is not because of the crisis that we're in at the moment. This is this has been a long, ongoing issue. So that really is something I would like to see addressed, given where we're all sitting at the moment. Brilliant. Okay. Thanks. I'm going to move on now to Fulton McGregor. I know that Pam's got a couple of other questions. Yeah, thanks, convener. Uh, thanks, convener, and good morning to the panel. I, I, my main question is um, around an area that I know uh, has had a, a quite a bit of discussion already this morning, and it's around the um, the 18-month extension on the action plan. Um, can I ask? You know, and I'm happy for it to, to be in any order. What the panelists' thoughts are on the 18-month extension, and do you think this is enough? Do you think this is enough time? To, so, so to Fulton, if you could just direct it, because otherwise we don't know where to spend the camera. Oh, okay, that's fine. Uh, well, I'm quite happy to start with. Um, sorry, put, put them on the spot. Then, I'm quite happy to start with uh, with uh, David Donaldson. I think. Yeah, it's a difficult one to say because you know the the pandemic is not over, and um, the the lockdown is, but we're still seeing it impact in many different ways, and certainly at a local level, um, much of the local authority provision and support has still to be, um, you know, taken forward again after having been suspended after the last lockdown. Um, we're still seeing physical interaction not preferred by some. We're still seeing people who. You know, we have to recognise that disability and um, long-term health conditions within the Gypsy Traveller community are very prevalent. So many within our community are still very cautious about people coming around, about you know physical meetings as well. So that's something to be thought about. I think we need to have a deadline. We can't just have the action plan going on forever because it needs to remain an action plan and not just a list of things we would like to happen someday. Um, so I do think the eighteen months initially is a good period. And I would go back to a point that, that Suzanne made around the sustainability and around well where do we go next? I think that's perhaps a better conversation to have. You know, post that 18 months, where are we going to be? What are we going to do? What's the funding going to look like? You know, how how are we going to engage with the Gypsy Travel community at that stage? Where will we look to enhance accommodation? You know, I had a, a conversation with a Gypsy Traveller yesterday whose site is undergoing some renovations. They described it as a facelift. They actually weren't that happy with what was happening on the site. Um, they said that it was it was very much a facelift. It was quite um, well, the word isn't quite there for me, but um, you know it was it was what people saw. It was quite aesthetic what was happening, and it, it didn't actually improve. For example, the the heating of the the chalets and the blocks. It didn't improve the amount of people who could stay on the site. The site was still the same size. It didn't improve the standard of living on the site, you know. So there seems to be a disconnect from what we're hearing out of COSLA and hearing out of local authorities who are spending this money, which is good. But actually, it might not be getting spent in the way that many gypsy travellers want, or it isn't simply isn't enough money to make a, a significant difference on sites for gypsy traveller people. So I think the real conversation to be had is what do we do post eighteen months. Yeah, that's that's very helpful to have. Um, I, I didn't see anybody else wanting to specifically come in, but Suzanne, um, I'm wondering if, if you're wanting uh, to come in, and, come in and ask even briefly. Yeah, I mean, again, you know, I, I think um, you know a, a lot has already been said, but I totally agree with Davy that the issue has to be sustainability. Um, you know, we are not going to uh, make wholesale change across all of the priorities in the action plan within 18 months. But, you know, the further we, we, we dig, the more that we go into things, the more things are uncovered, and there will always be new priorities 
emerging, you know, from the community. So it is about sustainability and how how it just becomes embedded in in everything that that we do going forward. You know, from um, the um, education, the professional education of practitioners across the board, looking at structures and processes, and I think most importantly how the community are supported to be at the very heart of this. So I think the sustainability one is the key issue. Yeah, thanks for that. And if there's nobody else wanting in, just, just before I, I pass back over to uh, the convener, I just wanted to put in record my thanks for all the work that all, all of the panellists have done over the last few years in tackling uh, head on the, the unacceptable discrimination faced by Gypsy travellers, you know, I've I've came across you all uh, in various guises over the last couple of years in the, the, the sister committee of the last parliament, uh, and also the um, also in, in various cross party groups. And, and you know, I, I was actually I, I hope the convener doesn't mind me telling this wee story, but I was actually at an event one Sunday. Um, it was a a children's show. I took my two boys to. Uh, it was in at the uh, in at Glasgow. At the pavilion, and um, and this uh, this I think indicates how much work you have done that maybe it sometimes goes unnoticed. And it was a kids' show; it was about dinosaurs and stuff like that, and it was a play, and it was it was really good. But there was one comment, and it was a very lively show, and the audience were interacting and, and laughing. And there was uh, one point in it where so that's the context for this comment, and one of the actresses, and it was it was that unconscious bias. I don't there was nothing she meant by it, and she was referring to a child, so. Wasn't any reference to gypsy travellers, but she she used the word tinker, and the audience there was a there was almost like a gasp within the audience. It so much so that you know my kids actually asked me what a tinker was, and I could hear uh, another kid away over the other side of the hall uh, asking the same question. So this was a quite a lively show, and that was the response. And I thought maybe five years ago that would have had a laugh. You know, or something like that. And I thought about this evidence session coming up today, and I thought that's a lot of the work that's down to some of the panelists that are coming in front of us today. So I hope you don't mind um, me sharing that story. I, I, something just dawned on me earlier when people were talking. Maybe I was meant to be there on Sunday with an evidence session just on this, just two days later. So almost a, a, a responsibility to share that and praise the good work that, that you have done because you have. And you won't see the societal changes because you're living the fight every single day. But I think that was one very small and obviously personal and anecdotal example. But I think it, it was definitely worth sharing. Thanks, convener, for allowing me to. Yeah. yeah. To well, thank, thanks for that, Fulton. I mean, clearly, clearly we have made progress, but we know there's well, there's some pretty horrific evidence that we've we've got some distance still to go um, on on some of, tackling some of that that racism. Um, uh, Pam Gossel, please. Convener, and thank you to all. Right, Pam, Pam, your microphone has gone off. Mm. I think you're back. You maybe start again. Can you hear me okay? It's okay now. Oh, okay, thank you. Well, thank you, Convener, and I want you to thank the witnesses and for their opening statements and their responses to all the questions. It truly does um, provide a picture of all the issues um, that people have been facing. And I would also like to thank all the work you've been doing uh, through COVID and before as well. My question is more around, uh, we know that, that the access to education is already something that affected the gypsy and traveller community. And today, we have heard the lack of devices or internet access is likely to have exacerbated the digital divide and access, resulting in digital inequality. What do you think should be done to help close the gap? And should the Scottish Government initiate maybe a catch-up kind of programme targeted at Gypsy um, and Traveller community? And my question goes out to Maureen first, and then Lynn and the others. And Kavina, if it's okay, I wanted to ask a quick question after this on um, the racial side as well. Okay, try and try and merge them in. Yeah, but yeah. So was that was that Maureen? Did you say? Yes. Sorry, Maureen. <laughs> sorry, Maureen. 
<laughs> Hi there. Thank, thanks for that question. And, and it's, it's the million dollar question. Um, so, um, in, in my mind, it has not been the lack of kits or resources and even access to the internet. It has been um, the confidence and the ability to use um, the, 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 the technical devices in a way that improves um, outcomes. Um, I mean, my, my business, obviously, education. Um, what we've done to try to tackle it, um, but we don't have funding. We're doing this in a very, very kind of temporary way. Is we're doing a two-teacher approach, so we're sending out a person to a family, and then somebody's at the other end. Um, so it's you're being supported in the home, learning how to actually um, communicate digitally and how to access resources. But I think from an education perspective. Um, digital technology is only as good as the programme that it's actually working to. So, you know, we absolutely need in, in education fronts, we need blended learning in terms of access to other public services. You know, it needs to be clear. We need to remember that um, many, many, many um, traveller families have low literacy levels across the generations. So, you know, all the work that we are doing just now has got transcriptions, so you don't have, need to be able to read. Everything turns into audio, that kind of thing. So, there's a whole range of strategies that are not in place to support the access to, to digital technology, which increases the digital divide. Because if you're in a house where your parents are whiz kid, then you know you're flying ahead. Gypsy travellers are falling further and further and further behind. Uh, thank you, Maureen. Uh, can I go over to Dr. Lynn? A little bit about now, obviously, Maureen's just said that it's not the access, it's that one-to-one -one learning that people need. And do you think there should be a catch-up programme targeted at the Gypsy and Traveller community? Um, probably uh, more to that point than just overall access. Yeah, um, I just I just want to echo first of all what Maureen said, and funding is an issue, and overliving in tight times. But um, I was involved a couple of well, right at the beginning of COVID on getting a decent amount of funding actually to provide devices and data. Um, but there's no continued funding to sustain what was provided, it's particularly in terms of data access, um, or indeed increase. So that needs to be in place first of all. And the one-to-one -one support that was mentioned also. Leslie, you're probably better going to Leslie for this because she's you know, Article 12 are, are engaged in that at the moment. But back to my whole issue around capacity building, that's what's on offer, Article 12 of a learning programme. But what what I'm drawn to about it is it's online and we're talking about older young people, if you like. So the ones that may well be working when people would expect them to be in secondary school. But if there's an online learning programme, they can still be accessing that, but it's chicken and egg kind of thing, because you need to have the devices and have the training and feel confident um, to use it. And of course, as Maureen was saying there, we have to address the literacy levels within a whole family group. So that has to be offered to adults as well. So there has to be that whole it's it's looking at the whole family, if you like, not just the a young person or young people, and that does need that needs it needs to happen, and it will need a lot of funding. But you know, it's not it's not a huge community in the grander scheme of things, and you know, there's 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 been a lack of input and funding and will in past years. So yeah. Just to get back, you know, just even bring to the level that you know we've got a bit of equity across society, then yeah, that would be a good starting point. Thank you, Lynn. I think Leslie wants to come in. Yeah, thank you. Um, so Article Twelve has been picking up from what Lynn was able to get devices and data to young people and get them trained up. So that they were still able to access some of that support. And we've tried to continue some of that as we continue to do online learning and also do hybrid learning. Um, and it's taught us a lot about the potential for that, obviously, uh, especially if you're talking about families shifting in the future. It's a wonderful opportunity for giving that continuity we keep talking about. Uh, but it also has been very eye-opening in terms of support. So if you're talking about moving forward and having a push to really reach young gypsy travelers with devices um, to address digital poverty, it absolutely also requires that support 
that Dr. Fenn and Dr. Tammy are talking about. That uh, just to give you an example, we've had a young person recently that's joined our program, and it's been several sessions because their level of literacy means that just the basic usage of a computer is completely new to them. Um, we're using a lot of text-to-speech programs, that sort of thing, that they're not yet ready to even think about using the device on their own. It's very much one-to-one -one support as they learn to use it. So it really does take a lot of time for some of these young people to, again, like Dr. Tammy said, have the confidence to be able to move forward with this. Um, so. If you're thinking about a program like that, absolutely. I think it would be wonderful, uh, but it does need the kind of um, support to really think about the scale that would be needed there. Thank you, Le Leslie. Convener, if it's okay, could I ask Leslie that second question, please? Okay. My question around today, we've heard a lot about racial discrimination and racism, which actually has um, no place in society today, never mind the gypsy and traveler community. Can I ask the question around do you think there's more that needs to be done on the education and awareness, starting at kind of grassroots, maybe at schools, um, with the students and children, um, so that you know they go home to this and um, they talk about it, and um, you know that we root out any sort of racism or racial tension um, with the gypsy traveller community. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yes, what what I've heard directly from you. They do want to be going into schools and work at the level. I'm sure Dr. Fenn could address this as well, kind of what she's seen in schools. But for um, we have currently have a peer educator project where we've got a few young gypsy travelers that are are learning how to work with the community. And what they highlighted immediately when they said, when we asked them what they'd like to see change was we need to work on discrimination, we need to go into schools and talk to people. So I think that would be a big priority. All of them spoke of their experiences with bullying and exclusion in school. And like you said, having that opportunity for them to take that and then bring that message to their homes and um, the outside community in terms of getting that message from the school elsewhere would be fantastic. Thank you. Lynn, you wanted to say something, and I know Dr. Maureen mentioned racism as well, obviously being one of the issues, so if it's okay if Lynn can say something, and yeah. we can go back to Maureen, please. Yeah, um, Yeah. just just to, to mention, I've put it in the chat, actually, but we we brought Article 12, myself, brought the, the concept of Gypsy Roma Traveller History Month to Scotland in 2016, and it does have government endorsement now. And that in itself is building and building, and we managed to build it as an online provision during COVID. So that is a resource that's produced by community members that is growing and growing. So I would like to see, I know that schools are often, we don't have time to produce resources, we don't have funding, but here we have sitting this resource that will have much more added this year and the coming year's funding permitting. And you know, there is your starting point. So, you know, I think if we could if we could see that promoted a bit at central and local government level and down into schools, you know, we don't need to reinvent the wheel here. It's there. Thank you, Lynn. Maureen, did you have something to say on that as well? Because I know that you yeah. highlighted it. Yeah, yeah, I think I think there's two sides to this. You know, there's there's pr promoting the positive messages. And I would have to say that to my knowledge, you rarely get like racist bullying in primary schools. So, you know, um, it kind of filters through into secondary school. And I would say that this is about how it's managed. And I think there's, again, it, it follows on the theme that we've been, we've been drawn on throughout, I think, this morning, is the fact that there's a lack of continuity of processes across the country. It varies not just from local authority to local authority, but school to school. Uh, I sit on the Race Equality in Education um, group, um, uh, Scottish Government's group, and the, recently the subgroup um, on uh, on on um, I, th I think it's the it's the language subgroup has changed the term bullying. In fact, pr prohibited the term the use of the term bullying, and it's now got to be described as a racist incident. And that's trying to like get across the message of the gravity of what that actually means to the people at the other end of that. 
Um, so, you know, in some ways, you know, in schools, it can bullying is a kind of a mushy term, you know what I mean? And I think it has to be seen for what it is. You know, it can affect lives, it can affect futures and all that kind of thing. And just finally, um, Step produced um, with Davy uh, Donaldson, um, Davy produced anecdotes from some of his travels and from our experience of working with young people. We brought together a whole range of bullying or racist incidents that had happened during their experiences of going to schools. And we turned it into an unfinished graphic novel, and we distribute that now throughout the country. And it's used by teachers um, with, with gypsy travel for children in the class, but not just any class can use this as part of a literacy lesson. And the children have to finish off the story. Look at where a blind eye was turned, which is normally what happens. A report wasn't recorded. Um, you know, a child felt unsupported. A child was supported, but the children have then got to finish off the story. And you'll find that the majority of young people don't have any racist attitudes to the gypsy travellers within their community. It's what spills out, out with the school community that becomes the real problem, and it's not managed in schools. Thank you, Maureen. I think Davy wants to come in on this. Yeah, there's there's no end of, of examples of, of racism and, and discrimination. Um, and I'm sure that everyone sitting around this virtual table today can, can give anecdotal evidence, very recent anecdotal evidence um, from, from across the board. So I think it's certainly an issue that's been recognised for a long time as being an issue. I think there's a lot of strength in focusing on burns and, and getting the education in at the very early stages of education, both at primary and I also echo what Maureen's saying because I agree in that going into secondary is where we see a lot of the issues mm -hmm. to the fore and those hate incidents becoming a lot more serious as well. So I think those two areas of education, those early areas of education, are places we should see more learning about gypsy traveller cultures, communities um, and of course the inequalities that we face. But I also don't want us to overlook the importance of professional development, of professionals being given the opportunities to challenge their own unconscious bias, giving the opportunities to challenge stereotypes that they may have been brought up with from their own parents, so that we don't see decisions being made that are negative towards gypsy travellers as a result of those biases and racial attitudes. Um, and we have seen some great work happening at universities, and there's a great scheme that's been endorsed with uh, a few universities in Scotland now that's looking at building not only equity of gypsy travellers um, and Roma as well, gypsy Roma and travellers into university settings as students um, and in cases as, as teachers and lecturers, but it also looks at, well, how do universities actually grasp the, the notion of race, racism towards gypsy Roma and traveller people and how do they mitigate that within their own student bodies and their own and professionals as well. So I think it can't be all focused on one area. I think it has to be tiered. It has to be intersectional throughout all professions. But where, as a gypsy traveller, where I want it to be most um, acutely felt, I feel like it's been done at primary and secondary school, or it's been getting done in those areas a lot more, and that's something to be celebrated. But we're still not seeing for the likes of um, Police Scotland, for example, civil service, um, you know, people who have, in often cases, you know, authority and control over people and their decisions that they make make a big difference on people's lives, still don't have a grasp of who Gypsy Roma and traveller people are, and still don't have a grasp on the histories and cultures of those peoples. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thanks, Pam. Um, I guess just, just following on from that that point, I'll, I'll maybe just stick with with with, with Davy initially, certainly. Obviously, the racism that the Gypsy Travel Scotland Gypsy Traveller community experiences isn't um, unique internationally, and we are every day seeing the, the horrors of what's happening in Ukraine. I mean, we, we know that um, in, in Ukraine, the Gypsy Roma Traveller community there uh, um, experience the same sort of racism as, as do the, the Gypsy Roma Traveller community in, in, in Russia. And I wonder if anybody wants to, to, to say a few words about that and, and maybe the experience. In relation to um, refugees coming to Scotland, um, but but Dave, Davey first it kind of follows on, I think, from what you were saying. Yeah, I think I mean we're all harrowed by the the stories and and the reports coming out of Ukraine um, and Russia as well, of course, of of the treatment of Roma people across there. Um, I'm acutely aware of it being the chairperson of Romano Lab in Glasgow, um, and our role is principally to support Roma. Uh, many of whom have migrated from Eastern Europe 
um, in, in Glasgow and made their homes in, in Govan Hill and, and Clyde Bank. For us, we are greatly concerned not only with the treatment of the Roma cross in Ukraine, we, we've seen, just for those of you that perhaps haven't seen this, but we've seen treatment of Roma refugees making their way to Poland and other countries bordering Ukraine and being treated totally different from um, non-Roma Ukrainian refugees. Some have been refused food and water, some have been limited the food and water they're allowed, some have been refused entry at the border. Um, you know, it's it's been horrific, some of the reports coming out, and I urge everyone on this committee to, to look into that. But for us, and certainly sitting in Scotland, well, what can we do? We're seeing, obviously, the homes for, for refugees and, and the homes for Ukraine being broadened out. Team, of course, where you can offer a spare bedroom, or if you're fortunate enough to own multiple properties, perhaps a property to refugees as well. Something at Romana Lab that we're worried about is how can Roma access that scheme? many of whom have literacy issues as well. You're right in saying this, Joe, in that a lot of the issues that we see in, in Scotland in terms of literacy, in terms of formal education, um, you know, employability, all these kind of things are replicated and, and seen elsewhere in Europe. However, how can we make sure that the system for that scheme is equitable for Roma people to come through? But also, when Roma do come to this country, how can we ensure that they are not going to be exploited We've heard rumours and reports of people, uh, particularly farmers, I have to say, who are planning on taking on um, multiple Ukrainian refugees, many of whom are Roman, the ones they've identified, and will be exploiting them in terms of labour. That's something that we're taking forward at Romano Lab to, to tackle. How can we make sure that this does not give rise to a crisis in modern slavery as well? So I think there's a lot of issues there. Um, of course, we're all aware of Ukraine, but how can we, at the, in Scotland, make sure that those issues do not come to the fore? But thanks, Davy. Um, Lynn, I, th I think I saw you kind of maybe indicating you had something to say. Well, yeah. it's, it's, I don't think there's much I can add to that. And as you know, it's, it's just about understanding everybody's humanity. There's a lot of images floating about Twitter just now, which again we need to be careful that they're not. You know that they are real; they're not propaganda and what have you. But if they are indeed real, then that is—it's quite shocking because you know punishment beatings are never acceptable anywhere, whether it's you know in a war setting or what have you. But like any group of refugees, it has to be at the forefront that they're given the same protections as any other community that, and and, and will happen in Scotland, I'm sure. And I see from the chat that Suzanne is saying that that is an issue that the, the community raised with um, the Minister, Christina McKelvey, recently. And we are obviously speaking to uh, the Minister next week, so we will we'll maybe raise, raise it then as well. But we are kind of coming to the end of the time, um, and we have covered a lot of ground. But I just want to check if any of our um, committee members have a burning question that they want to get on. Uh, yeah, OK. Pam. Pam Duncan Glancy. Thank you, convener, um, and thank, thanks for allowing me this. Um, it's just uh, around access to justice and representation. Um, so members might know I've, I've been meeting with members of the Gypsy Travel community affected by the programme that took place um, between 1940 and 80, um, which was ultimately badly designed to integrate Gypsy travellers into mainstream society, and, and we know the impacts of that. Um, on, on the people involved were widespread, including post-traumatic stress disorder, long-term depression, um, and effects of long-term uh, ostracisation are some of the things that they've, they've highlighted. Um, and despite that, the, the, the community, and, and they've highlighted this for a, a number of years, the community are looking um, for, for an apology um, and redress. And I'm just keen to hear from um, possibly Davy and Lynn, if that's OK, um, whether you, you feel that 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 would be that would be helpful, and the impact that that could have on access to justice um, for for gypsy travellers, and also um, whether or not you feel that people are empowered um, in that community to enjoy the, the human rights that they that they have, and to hold people to account for them. So I think I think going to Davy first. You, Davy, you mentioned it in your opening sum summary, didn't you? The, the forced centralisation and the forced removal of, of many Gypsy Traveller children throughout the early 20th century, and we have cases going right on until the early 1970s, 
is an issue that has been articulated by many gypsy traveller activists for decades now, and something that I'm really glad to hear, Pam, you, you've taken a personal uh, interest in and forward in as well. I think an apology goes some way uh, and will go some way to, to helping with the cultural trauma that has been created as a result of many of these activities, uh, both for the victims of the forced removals and the forced sedentarisation, as well as the, the relatives of them as well who have been brought up hearing of that trauma and how it impacted on their own families. I think the apology is something that will be very welcomed. We have um, been pushed back with the apology in, in, in previous years, um, but I think with the apology given to the LGBT community and others, um, of course, on, on actions that had happened prior to this administration, as well as the First Minister's apology as well for um, the, uh, the, the burning of witches and, and uh, you know something that happened a good long time before devolution. I think the, the argument is certainly there that even though this happened prior to devolution, an apology should certainly be made and would be very welcomed. However, I would urge that if an apology is to be made, it is made with the understanding that an apology in and of itself will not fix things, and that this cultural trauma really does intersect with all of the inequalities that gypsy travellers um, are continuing to face in our country. And I would certainly urge for a conversation to begin around what can we do to resolve that cultural trauma, what can we do to make sure that the history of this trauma is told, and how we can decolonise the curriculum like how we have done with other communities and actions that I've been involved with as well. But how can we make sure that those actions are also taken into account the forced sedentarisation and forced removal of gypsy travellers throughout the 20th century? Thank you, Pam. Um, Jeremy, were you wanting to come in? Yeah, thanks, Pam, for, the, for raising that and the opportunity to speak on this. Many people that know me know that this is that this is this has directly impacted on me and my family. We had three, um, three of my grandfather's sisters were removed from the roadside camp, spent some time in one of the large NGOs, um, charities, sites, and then were trafficked to Canada. So it's, 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 I'm quite emotional even speaking about this here because it, you know, it brings all that back up. And I wasn't prepared that this would come on the agenda, but anyway. It, it's, I have shared it before, and um, the various programmes would have spoken about it. We were lucky enough to find the means as generations moved on to reconnect with the family members. So there's still the, the women that were taken. The last one died in uh, 2002, but obviously their children will have years still. So we're, we're we're still in contact with them. Um, the whole thing around an apology is quite a difficult one for me because I'm not. Whilst an apology would be welcome, and, and for many people it's needed, I'm not sure that um, an apology is, is going, would ever make things right for us. Because mm. you know, it, 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 it can your family can never be what it is. The people that were trafficked can never be with their family or live the life that they should have lived. An apology is important for the people that that will find that that will give them peace. But I also think that if we are looking at something, we should be looking at something along the lines of truth and reconciliation. There needs to be opportunities to speak, and for those who want to speak, to speak to the ongoing trauma and what is still in your DNA, because we know there has been research now that that does continue into your DNA. And you know, it is something that us as a family will never forget, and we pass that on to our grandchildren and their children and so on and so forth. I would like to feel less emotional when I am speaking about it, so probably an apology would help me and other members of my, my family with that. But I do think that if we are talking about we are going down the line of apologies, then gypsies and travellers need to be central to that. They should not be pushed aside for whatever amount of spurious reasoning and whatever. For, for for many gypsies and travellers, that will bring peace. And I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate. I appreciate thanks, it. thanks very much, and and thank thanks for for sharing that, Lynn. That's that's really helpful. And I, as um, I think Pam's indicated, this is an area that 
uh, the committee will look at um, in terms of future future work at, as well. But I know there's other other processes on on a foot as 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 well. Um, th listen, th thank you all so much. That has been so helpful um, in terms of is that big range of areas that I think we, the committee will want to look at um, ag again and, and maybe come back to you. But I think right back at the start, I said that we were determined you know, to, to get out of the parliament, get out of our, um, our offices or our virtual offices um, and, um, and meet directly with the community. So we might come back to you to, to help facilitate some of, some of that engagement so that we can hear directly um, from members of, of, of the community in the future. So that, thank, again, thank you very much. Um, that brings the public part of our meeting to a close. We'll now move into private session for the final items on our agenda, which um, will start in five minutes, um, colleagues. Thank you all very much. <laughs>